Sweet. So to talk about wave optics, first thing you got to understand is just interference. So if we had a couple of waves, let's say. So in this case, we'd say these two waves are in phase. What do I mean by in phase here? Yeah. Positive with positive, negative with negative. And so in this case, what would be the result of these two waves being in phase? You'd get a, just a giant wave. So it just combines the two. So the two waves additive and when positive lines up with positive, negative with negative, the positive region gets more positive, the negative region gets more negative. We call that constructive interference. So however, So if I have two waves that are exactly, we say, 180 degrees out of phase, where positive lines up with negative or negative with positive, what happens when you add these two waves, assuming they have the same amplitude anyways? You get nothing. And we call that destructive interference. <coughs> cool. These ideas of constructive interference and destructive interference is pretty much the groundwork conceptually for everything we're about to look at in this chapter. Sweet. So first thing we're going to look at is Young's double slit experiment. So in Young's double slit experiments is actually one of my favorites. It's actually not his experiment, so, but when they did something similar to this with electrons. So quantum mechanics, we study this, and it's quite the interesting thing. You see that this interference pattern happens you know, with light, and we explain it, yeah, the light waves are interfering with each other, and it's great. So, but you see it with electrons too. Notice electrons have a wavelength associated with them. So we see light is both wave-like and particle-like properties. Well, so does matter. Matter has both particle-like and wave-like properties. And we can see those with electrons. If we do something similar to Young's double slit experiment with electrons, we see the same kind of interference patterns. We're like, oh, voila, it's a wave too. Problem is, is it still happens if you shoot one electron through at a time. They don't really know what that means exactly. Like, so is the electron interfering with itself? Usually I need, you know, two light waves to interfere, either constructively or destructively. But here they see an interference pattern with electrons with only one at a time. So what's it interfering with? Who knows? So kind of one of this thing, they still debate what it really means. But, and it's one of my favorites. But with light, it's a little more straightforward. So we shine monochromatic light. So and there's two slits, and maybe I'll just draw them a little bigger than I normally would just to emphasize here. But these two slits are fairly close together, typically. And so when the light shines through, it's got two different places where it can shine through the surface. So then we'll set up a screen, and we usually set the screen up way, way, way far away compared to this distance. And everything we do assumes that the distance to the screen, where we're going to look at the observations here of the light, are much further than this distance of separation here. So, but the distance between these two slits, we're going to call D. Cool. We'll set up a screen way over here. And again, typically I'd make that even farther away if I was really trying to diagram this out, what we really should be looking at, but it gets a little bit ridiculous at that point. So in this case, because we have a light wave, say, coming from this point. And light waves are coming every direction out of this, essentially. So, but they're also coming out of every direction here. And so light may strike the same point twice from two different sources here, two different slits. The question is, when they strike, are they overlapping constructively or destructively? If they're overlapping constructively, you're going to see a big brightness. It's going to, the amplitude of the light is going to increase. But if they're overlapping destructively, so then you're going to see a, a dark fringe, we call it. And so what you end up usually seeing on this screen is you see an alternating pattern of bright fringe, dark fringe, bright, bright fringe, dark fringe, bright fringe, dark fringe. So usually right in between the two slits, you see a central bright fringe. So, and then you're going to see dark fringes on either side. And then you just have this alternating pattern going in both directions. 
of bright fringes, dark fringes, just along the whole spectrum. Cool, if we look at kind of some of the conditions that's gotta be true here, to make this true, it might make this make a little more sense, but end of the day, you have gotta really know how to use the equations. So if we look here for a minute, <coughs> which one of these traveled a longer distance to get to that point? The top light wave or the bottom light wave? The bottom one, it traveled a further distance. Notice, if they had traveled, if they'd come from the same source on this side, traveling through the slits, and had traveled the same distance, they would be perfectly in phase all the way to the, to the screen. But because in this case they're traveling a different distance, when they join up and interfere here, they might be in phase again, or they might be out of phase or anything in between. Well, we're only gonna look at the cases where they're exactly in phase or they're exactly 180 degrees out of phase. The only cases we'll actually examine. <laughs> so if you look here, <clears throat> trying to figure out the best way to kind of diagram this out. So if you look here, um, let's say instead of this situation, I have two light waves that start out in phase, if you will, but instead I start one of them a little further behind. But it still starts out positive first and so on and so forth. So if you look at how far behind I've started it, well it turns out I started it behind exactly one half wavelength. And because of that, they were in phase but half a wavelength off of each other. Because of that, notice when they do actually overlap here, what, it's gonna, what are we going to see? What kind of interference? We're going to see destructive, plus with minus, and so on and so forth. Notice if I back this guy up a little further, instead of half a wavelength, let's back it up a full wavelength now. And so now we see that a full wavelength early, what kind of interference are we going to see now? Constructive interference. Sweet, and that's kind of the principle we're gonna look at here. So one of these light rays, depending on which point you're talking to, or you know, which point we wanna look at, we could look at any point along this region, one of these light rays is gonna travel further than the other in most of those cases. So and in traveling further, the key is, it's really like you're kind of starting it a little bit behind the other one. If you've started it behind the other one, if you will, if the distance further it travels is some number of wavelengths, then they're gonna constructively overlap. But if it's some half number of wavelengths, not a whole number, but a half number, one half, three halves, five halves, seven halves wavelengths, then they're gonna destructively overlap. And it's from that that we'll actually uh, derive our lovely equations. So a couple things we do here. So getting an exact expression for how this works is difficult, so we cheat. How many of you like cheating? You weren't supposed to actually raise your hand. So, but here, in something like this, I definitely like cheating. So, because it's just much more fun mathematically to cheat. And it's a good approximation still. So all the equations we have here are approximations because we cheat just a little bit. So, but again, imagine that this screen is really super, super, super far away. So as a result, if you look at the angle here, which I'll call theta. So, and do the same thing here with the horizontal of this one. So that angle to, th to the horizontal we'll call, actually I guess, I guess uh, we'll call theta. Are these two angles exactly equal? No, but assuming that this distance between the slits is very small and the distance to the screen is really, really big, they're actually gonna be approximately equal. They're not exactly equal, but as long as those two requirements are met, the distance between slits is small, the distance to the screen is large, they'll be pretty close to equal. Well, we're gonna assume they're equal. We're gonna assume they're exactly equal, even though they're not. So, and to make this a little easier to see, instead of drawing squiggly lines, now I'm gonna just draw them straight out. So, let's say we're looking at what kind of interference occurs at that point right there. So, these two angles theta are not exactly equal. Cool, but we're gonna pretend for a minute they are. If I was pretending that these angles theta are actually equal, 
then how would these lines actually be related to each other, assuming theta really was equal? They'd be parallel. Are they really parallel? No. So what we're doing is we're saying instead of one of these lines actually, instead of them actually intersecting at this point, we're imaginarily pretending that we actually have a line, that same line, but we're going to take that same line and just bend it over a little bit so that's a parallel line. And we could see that, oh yeah, it really is longer, going all the way to this point here, it really is longer than the other line. And it's in that comparison that we're actually going to compare these two lines. So <coughs> it doesn't look all that parallel, but trust me, they were supposed to be. So in this case, in fact, let's just make them look a little more parallel. Good picture's worth a lot. All right, so we can see that this bottom line, if you drop it back down to being parallel, is indeed a longer line than this one here. The question is, how much longer? So, well, it's this distance longer, right? So in that distance, I'm going to call the difference in the length between these two rays. So, and the key is, is this difference in the length equal to a multiple of wavelengths? That's constructive interference. Is it equal to a multiple of half wavelengths, odd number anyways? One half, three halves, five halves, seven halves? Then there's going to be destructive interference occurring at this point. So, my next question for you is what is this length right here? What is that length right here? Yeah, same as it was on the other side with these two parallel lines. So this right here is D. So and if we make a right triangle here, it's not going to look like the greatest right triangle here. So mm, not the greatest right triangle at all, but it's supposed to be. So what we'll find is that that looks like a terrible right triangle. It's supposed to be like that, with delta L being there. But if you look, this delta L right here is d sine theta, with theta being this angle right here, the same theta we defined earlier. And so the difference in the length of our two rays is d times sine theta, the same d we had as the distance between the splits, the slits, I should say. Again, this is really approximate, but we're going to treat it as exact for all our calculations. And as long as this d sine theta is equal to some multiple of wavelengths, then we're going to see constructive interference. So in constructive interference, we'll lead to our bright fringes. So here, m is just any integer starting at 0. So some multiple of wavelengths there. However, if on the other hand, d sine theta is equal to some multiple of half wavelengths, an odd number of half wavelengths, then in that case, we're going to see destructive interference, and those are going to be dark fringes. You'll see these equations presented in a couple of different ways. Oftentimes, they'll actually just solve it for sine theta and put the d on the other side. I wanted to keep it in this form just so we could match it up where we derived it. You do not have to know how to derive this. So, but if Deriving it helps you remember it, great. And why it is the way it is, awesome. But end of the day, you got to know how to calculate where the bright fringes are and where the dark fringes are. So if you notice, the first value of m is 0. And again, right in between the two slits is where you typically have a bright fringe. Because right in between the two, they would travel the same distance to get there. And would therefore, those two rays would be in phase. And that's when you'd plug in m equals 0 right there. 
If you plugged in m equals zero, what would you get for theta? Zero, because it's straight across. No angle with respect to those slits, if you will. So, but then when you plug in m equals one, that would be the next bright fringe on either side. And you could figure out based on the geometry, if you know this distance and you know the slit distance and stuff like this, you could start calculating how far from the central bright fringe is the next bright fringe and things of this sort. So, and we can relate all sorts of lovely stuff to the wavelength and the distance between the slits. Cool. Let's look at some examples. So number nine says a laser beam with a wavelength of 700 nanometers is incident on two slits separated by 0.2 millimeters. So in this case, D equals 0 0.0002 meters. So, and my wavelength really is equal to 700 times 10 to the negative nine meters. So I wanna make sure those are in SI units. Since they're both gonna potentially show up in the equation, they gotta be in the same unit so that they cancel. So I'll make them both SI in this case. Cool, question is what is the distance between the bright fringes on a screen placed four meters from the slits? So in this case, set up a little diagram. And again, I'll exaggerate this, but we got our two slits, lights coming through. Where's one of the bright fringes gonna show up? Right in the middle, halfway in between those two slits we'll see a bright fringe. So on either side of that, we'd see darkness. So, and then we'd see another bright fringe on either side of those, and just alternating dark and bright all the way down the chain. So, and the question we're actually trying to solve for here was again, what is the distance between bright fringes on a screen placed four meters from the slits? So we're told that this distance is 4.0 meters. We're asking for this distance here. What is that distance? What we're ultimately gonna do here is just make a right triangle and use some trigonometry to figure that out. So in this case, there's the right triangle I'm gonna make. Cool, and I'm gonna use that to find theta here. Cool, this theta here is also the same theta we'd see in these calculations here. The same, so as if we'd come from two different slits traveling to a common point, kind of in reverse, but the same theta. So we're actually gonna use one of these equations to get theta, and then take advantage of that back over here, realizing that this distance relative to the four meters here, we can use the tangent opposite over adjacent of that angle to get what this opposite side's length is. Cool, so in this case, are we doing bright, bright fringes or dark fringes? Cool, we're doing the bright fringes, so let's use this guy. So, and we just want the distance between any two bright fringes. So in this case, the easiest one to pick is the central one. So because you automatically already know that the original angle is zero, it's right in the middle relative to that. So you just gotta find the difference between an angle of zero and the next angle over. So you could pick the next two bright fringes down the chain, but then you'd have to find the angle of the first and the angle of the second to get that distance between. And I just don't really wanna go there. So much, I only got half the calculations if I go this way. So this first one is at an angle of zero degrees. So for the m equals zero bright fringe, what about the m equals one bright fringe in this case? So we got d sine theta. In fact, we'll just rearrange it all together. Sine theta is equal to one times lambda over d. So sine of theta equals one times, in this case, 700 times 10 to the negative nine meters all over 0 0.000020 meters. And can somebody take the inverse sine of that and get me theta? Anybody? Yeah. Cool, there's our theta. 
And so going back to this, back to our image, it's the same angle theta we got here in this big triangle. And so in this case, we can see that the tangent of this theta is going to equal the side we're looking for here, the opposite side, all over 4.0 meters, the adjacent side in this right triangle. And so from here, we'll see that 4.0 times the tangent of 0 0.2 is equal to our opposite side, which is what we're looking for. Anybody got me an answer there? 0 0.014 what? Cool, meters, which they could have given you as 14 millimeters if it was a multiple choice question or 1.4 centimeters, but I'll just leave it in meters and we're good to go. Any questions on that? So again, whether you really understood most of the derivation of these equations, end of the day, you need to know how to plug and chug these. So, and once you start plugging and chugging, if you want to find the distance between fr fringes, so you can use this to get theta, and then use theta and the tangent, some trigonometry, to find out what that distance is. But you can take it backwards as well. If I give you the distance, you could use that distance to find theta. So, and once you know theta, you could go back and find, you know, maybe the wavelength of the light used, or how far apart the slits were, or something along those lines. Cool.